God? God is our Father. I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure that out right now, actually. He's uh, the omnipotent. He's the Trinity. So, I mean, there's, again, other definitions, but that's the definition that I, that I uh, deem the one. It's not a who. It's a force. God is a mystery. We don't know. The, he's a creator. What does God do? God's there to protect us and uh, support us, create. He also takes away. Started everything somehow and just let it go. What do you think God looks like? I hope that it's just a massive space, maybe stars or something, not an actual person. I think it just appears to whatever form is most comfortable and like familiar and like loving to you. Yeah, so there we go. We are in the second week of our Questions for God series. Uh, these questions were provided by you. Lots of people around the congregation, you may recall a couple months ago, we had post-it notes all over the windows back there, and I took all those questions and categorized them as a series, and it's going to take us all the way through July. A lot of tough questions. Today we're kind of, the categories are around God's presence and love. God's presence and love. And there are four particular questions that we're addressing today. And the first one uh, comes from Jordan, uh, Stacia's son Jordan. Uh, how old is Jordan? About uh, 10 or 11 years old, I think. And uh, his big question is, who made God? Thanks, Jordan. That's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. And then we have an, uh, someone else who asked this question, what exactly is the Holy Spirit? What exactly is the Holy Spirit? That's a good question because we don't give a lot of air time to the Holy Spirit talking about it. And then, and then there's another one that's kind of a feeling-oriented question that we all uh, have felt one way or another. Why does it sometimes feel like God is not there for me? Anybody ever been there? Yeah. And then the last question is another biggie. How can you love me, God, speaking to God? How can you love me through times I'm so unlovable and hardly love myself? Yeah, I've had a lot of homework to do this week preparing for these questions, so you can pray for me. But before we get to these main questions, there were a few other questions. And one of the things I love about this series is basically you're dictating uh, the content in terms of the questions and the format. And a whole bunch of our children participated, and I love it. In fact, uh, one child asked this very, very important question, central to all our lives. Why is bacon so good? <laughs> To which the answer very simply is, God made it so good. Zoe Nygaard, Zoe, what, you're 12? 12 years old? Zoe Nygaard asked the question of me, how old are you? So Zoe, I'm as old as well-aged bacon. That's how old I am. Uh, Maddie McCargo, Maddie, where, how old is Maddie? Nine years old. Maddie asked me the question, where'd you come from? So Maddie... I came from my house where I ate bacon this morning. <laughs> and then Ethan Timmerman. How old is Ethan? Eleven. Seven. I knew he was younger than eleven. Like, seven. And he asked if I could jump over the moon. Ethan, the answer is, only if I've eaten bacon can I jump over the moon. All roads lead back to bacon. So... There you go. We got those out of the way. And now we're going to get to the big questions. And starting, and we're just going to kind of clip through them, okay? So, are you with me? Question number one, who made God? That's uh, in one sense hard and in one sense really easy. And you can say it in one sentence. God is the uncreated creator of all that is. The unmade maker of all that is. And we have a hard time getting our heads around it. There's a story about some scientists who are kind of challenging this because they feel like, you know, with all the scientific advancements today and cloning and in vitro fertilization, you know, we can basically do what you can do, God. And they got kind of prideful and, and they were kind of addressing God and challenging God. And God said, okay, let's have a contest. Let's have a man-making contest. And he said, all right, we'll do it. We're up for it. And God said, but we're going to do it like the old days. We're going to start with dirt. And they said, okay. They reached down and grabbed some dirt. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. You go get your own dirt. <laughs> God made even dirt. God, everything that exists comes from the creator who is himself uncreated. 
And so this eternal nature of God is one that the scriptures are always pointing us to. And it's so hard for us to understand. But this is the way Deuteronomy puts it. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Now we, we hear those words eternal and everlasting a lot throughout scripture. And we kind of associate them with really being a long time. But the word eternal actually is uh, the idea of being without a beginning and an end and being outside of time. Now think about this. You and I are familiar with beginnings and endings in lots of different ways. We're familiar with time. A lot of you have wristwatches on right now. We measure everything, beginnings and endings, by time. You start work, you finish work. You start worship, you finish worship. You start a meal, you finish a meal. Everything. We have birthdays and so on, right? There was, see if you can grasp this, there was a time when there was no time. There was, there was a time when nothing was created, but God was. The unmade maker, the uncreated creator. Psalm 90, verse 2 puts it this way. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. It's a very poetic way of saying you exist in and of yourself before anything existed, even time as we know it. Everlasting to everlasting is this idea of being outside of time. Now, the best way that I know to illustrate this, and I'm stealing this illustration from Rob Bell, and I want you to kind of pretend with me as you look at this marker and that marker, and, and uh, pretend that this marker represents all time. This is the beginning of time. This is when nothing was created, but there was a beginning. All major religions talk about a beginning of time, right? And, and this marker represents everything that happened in history, everything that is happening and will happen in your life, and everything that will happen to the end of time. Everything is contained in this marker. Everything we know, everything we will know. And here's how God relates to all of this experience of time. God can be behind it. God can be in front of it, underneath it, above it, and enter into it all at the same time. Right? We cannot begin to fathom what that even looks like. It's the best we can do. And why can't we fathom what's beyond us? Because we're trapped here. We're here. And God loved us so much that he came and became one of us, trapped here for a time as well in this person called Jesus. So that we would have this connection to the transcendent God. Transcendent and imminent. That's the notion of God. And so theologians have always wrestled with this idea of how do you get your mind around? How do you describe a God like this? And they came up with this phrase called the perfections of God. The perfections of God go like this. God is transcendent. Again, God is before, beyond, above, and all around Time as we know it transcends all that is. God is omnipotent, meaning all powerful. God is omnipresent, all present. There is nowhere where God is not. There never has been anywhere where God has not been. God is omniscient, meaning all knowing. Nothing gets past God. God is not going, oh, didn't think of that. Could have had a V8. God is eternal. We talked about that. God is everlasting, no beginning, no end, outside of time. God is almighty. We grasp at words out of human language, which is finite. To describe the infinite. We grasp at ways to understand this God that is sovereign and beyond anything that is describing. So, you go back to the early days of the church in the 4th century. The church was asking these kinds of questions. How do we understand this God? And so, the, for the very first time in the history of the church, they came together at what was called a council in a place called Nicaea in the 4th century. And they came up with a statement called a creed that would sort of define in a beautiful way some of what we're trying to get at about God. They took it from a Trinitarian perspective, talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now here's what I want to do. I want us together to recite the Nicene Creed, and it's going to come up in just a second. And as we're doing it, I want you to look for the indications of the perfections of God in it. The references to this almighty God, this unmade maker, this uncreated creator. Look at it as it refers to each person of the Trinity. Okay, you with me? So, here we go. Let's say the Nicene Creed all together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And all people said, Amen. Isn't it an amazing statement? An affirmation of this unmade maker, this uncreated creator. And part of what we affirmed in that, that gets at our second question, is this idea of what exactly is the Holy Spirit? We just said we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. And when we begin to try to understand the Holy Spirit, we want to go all the way back to the beginning of time. And that's where God was creating. And in the Hebrew, in the first chapter of Genesis, it uses the word ruach. That's a wonderful Hebrew word. You've got to have a little phlegm to get it right. Ruach. Ruach means, it can mean spirit, wind, or breath. And so God is breathing God's spirit into creation coming alive. And so this is how, as it says, the Ruach of God was hovering over the waters, breathing into creation. And we see this pattern throughout Scripture. Jesus is dead. He's resurrected from the grave. And the disciples are really, really afraid because their whole plan has been shot. And then Jesus appears to them. And listen to the way this plays out and what Jesus does to breathe new life into them. In John chapter 20, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, when the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, his scars from the cross, the nails. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And here it is. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You see what's going on there? They were afraid. They were dejected. They were lost. And he breathed new life into them. When Adam was created, remember how this works out in the beginning of creation? God creates Adam the bones, the sinews, the guts, everything is there. But he's not alive yet. When does Adam come alive? When God breathed into him. God basically did mouth to mouth. God breathed into him. This is the Holy Spirit. It's the giver of all life that we know. That's where it starts. That's how we begin to answer that question. And the Apostle Paul picks this up for the body of Christ, the people of God, the church, Christians. And this is how he frames it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You're possessed. You're a house of God. The Holy Spirit, this life-giving force is coming alive in you. The Holy Spirit is a gift of God's life in you. And it's how God brings you alive. You see how that works? Now, how do we recognize this? What do we see? And there are way too, there are over a hundred verses in the scriptures that talk about what the Holy Spirit looks like in you. So I'm going to give you some sampling, not of verses, just of characteristics or manifestations of the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit comes alive in you, and one of the very most obvious ways is what we call spiritual gifts. In the 12th chapter of Romans and in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, there's a list of spiritual gifts. Every Christian believer is endowed with special spiritual gifts that are for you to discover, to develop, and to deploy uniquely for you as a gift from God empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's a promise in Scripture. And that's a wonderful thing for us to exercise throughout our lives. 
The Holy Spirit brings what's called sanctification. That's a big theological word that simply means maturing your faith, making you holy, growing you and me up in our faith. The Holy Spirit is that which brings hope. Any thread of hope that you feel in your life is a gift of God's power in you. It brings joy. It brings renewal. Healing. Healing is always ascribed to the Holy Spirit in scriptures. This is God's power. And we would say even in the medical arts of today, in medical science, this is part of the way God's Spirit works through people, through intellectuals, through people who are trained in the medical sciences. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit as being the comforter. So when you're in a place of loss in your life, when you're in a place of deep grief, it's the Holy Spirit that comes to comfort your heart, to sustain you, to hold you. The Holy Spirit is responsible for cleansing. The Holy Spirit gives us peace. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. How does he do that? Through the leaving and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is responsible for converting you and me. That means that your faith, you, you can take a lot less credit for your faith than you think you can. This is the gift and the power of God working in you through the Holy Spirit. God is alive in you and me. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God. Directing your conscience. Speaking to your conscience. As it's consistent with what we see in God's word. You can't just claim that God told me to do it just because you hear it. It's always measured against what God's word is saying. And that's why it's important to do Bible study. So the Holy Spirit is all these things. This is manifestation. This is how we recognize the Holy Spirit working in us. The Holy Spirit is God's life coming alive in you. Filling you and me. Because we put all kinds of other voices in there, don't we? All kinds of other stuff. Or we just have a lot of empty space. And God is coming to fill it with his power, his presence, his direction, and all of these things. Now, what, is this, what does this look like? Back in the, the late 19th century, Dwight Moody is a famous evangelist. And he was trying to address this question. Dwight Moody was a very, very charismatic guy. And he began to ask this question about what does it mean to be filled by the Holy Spirit? And so he took a glass that was half full of water. And he was in a room like this with people. And he asked them, he said, well, this glass is half full of water, just like this one. What do you think it would take... To remove all the air out of the second half of the glass. And people were puzzled. And he went around and he polled people. And someone finally came up with an idea that said, Well, if you just take a vacuum and you vacuum, you suck out all the air in the second half of the glass, that might work. And he said, Well, if you do that, the glass would actually crush in on itself. He said, The only way that you can remove all the air out of this half filled glass is to pour more water in it, to fill it full. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is about doing in your life and in mine. That's why we're here. Because we have empty spaces in us, empty places in us, don't we? And we put the wrong things in there that don't fit. And he wants to fill us full to overflowing with his power, his presence, and with all the manifestations that are promised to us in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit wants to fill your empty space, replace what is life depleting with her life-giving presence and presence. And I say her because the Holy Spirit is always feminine grammatically in the Greek text. And so, that leads us to the third question. And this is a doozy because we all tap into this question, don't we? Why does it sometimes feel like God is not there for me? Well, we're beginning to get at it. The more you let God through the Holy Spirit fill you, the more aware you are of God's presence. But what I would say about this is there's a real tripwire with one word. You know what the word is? Feel. We are so feeling oriented. It's really a, a big red flag for us. And this is what I want to say about that question. And the first way of responding to it is this. Focus your faith on facts, not feelings. Focus your faith on facts, not feelings. Here are some facts for you to consider. Do you know what the most often spoken, the most frequently spoken promise of God is to you and me in the scriptures? The most frequently spoken promise to God, from God to you and me, is I will be with you. God promises that more than anything else in scripture. I will be with you. That's a fact. Even when we don't feel it, don't see it, don't believe it, it doesn't make it not real. The Bible is the story of God's rescue mission. The Bible is the story of God going, you know, I exist outside of this time and space, this trap that they're in. But I'm going to come in there and be with them, identify with them. I'm going to rescue them. The Bible is the story of the rescue mission so that we're not trapped here, but we are with God eternally. The Bible is the story of God entering our world, your world. 
The Bible is the story of God entering our pain, your pain, whatever it is. John Ortberg has a book and he talked about this whole idea of how close God comes to us and it's called God is Closer Than You Think. And it's true, God is closer than you and I often think and certainly feel. And this is what he said in that book. He said, the story of the Bible is not primarily about the desire of people to be with God. It's the desire of God to be with people. I mean, this God who existed outside of this, just fine, didn't need us, wants us, wants you. That's what's so amazing. And so our feelings can be deceptive. And we always have to question our feelings. Your feelings can easily and often blind you to the reality of God's presence. There's a wonderful way of illustrating this. Uh, Donald McCullough tells a story about sailing on a lake in Washington State. It was a beautiful day. The wind was gently lapping through the sails. It was a small sailboat just like that. It was crystal clear day. You could see for miles and miles. But in a little boat just like this person, you can see that if you're on one side of the sail, it blocks your vision to the other side. Things are going along swimmingly. And all of a sudden, 30 yards in front of the bow of the boat, that's the front of the boat, a seaplane lands. He didn't hear it. He didn't see it. It landed. He nearly fell out of the boat. He was so scared by it. Can you imagine that? This thing just is there all of a sudden. Now, was it not there because he didn't see it? Of course it was there. He was blinded by the sail. And that's the way our feelings function very often. They're the sail. And we may feel good about everything, but we don't see everything. Our feelings can be so deceptive, can't they? Your feelings are the sail that can block your perception of God's presence. So, we go back to not our feelings, but to the facts of Scripture. And one of the, one of the wonderful passages that I want to point you to, and for us to unpack a little bit, is in the 8th chapter of Romans. It's a glorious, wonderful chapter. And it's here that Paul is talking about this idea of adoption. Uh, we have people in our congregation that are adopted and, and children that have been adopted. And so this is going to be a neat thing for you to kind of hear. But here, it, Paul is, is, is using this image uh, to speak about you and me. And God's presence to us and our place with God. And this is what he said in Romans 8. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you out of, about, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What's Paul saying? He's saying, your status is just like an adopted child in his day. Now, back in Paul's day, in the ancient world, a father went out and often adopted like a teenage son. Handpicked to carry on the name and to receive the estate. Hand chosen. He had the same status as a naturally born son. In the ancient Rome... The son who was adopted, and it was always a son, by the way, sorry, ladies. Um, the son who was adopted had these particular benefits. They gained the legal rights of a new family. The son also became heir to the father's estate. And here's a really interesting one. If that son had any debts, guess what? Number three, all old debts were canceled. And then finally, they were legally a new person according to the laws of the land. Now think about those things. And Paul's saying, this is what you and I inherit. Whatever we're indebted to, enslaved by, is gone when we're adopted into God's presence, into God's family. We're given a new identity. We're given the whole estate of the Father. We inherit everything that is Jesus's. And, and so, in the ancient world, whenever a father would die, the adopted son, in order to receive the estate had to have seven witnesses who could vouch for their being truly adopted, legally adopted. And whenever that happened, then, and only then, could he receive all the estate. So what is Paul saying to you and me? Think about it. He's saying the Holy Spirit is your legal witness of adoption to God's family. The Holy Spirit comes as the one who is validating your place with God and mine. God's presence. We are brought into the family of God. God is our Father, Abba Father. And we are part of this. He will never leave us. He loves us intimately. And that leads us to the biggie, the last question. How 
God, can you love me? Even through times I'm so unlovable and hardly love myself. Now really, you see what we're getting at is the nature and character and the promises of God. And the more you know the nature and the character and the promises of God, the, more, the less relevant this question comes. Because the power of all that is unloving and unlovable in our life, in your life, does not hold a match to the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. It doesn't come anywhere close to it. And the most majestic description of that is at the end of Romans chapter 8. I love, love, love this affirmation. This is what Paul said. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Could he have covered any more bases? It's absolutely fascinating. And when you understand what he was saying in his time to the people listening, the very first audience, it's even more amazing. When he talks about how neither angels nor demons can separate us, they don't have the power to separate us, what you need to know is this. In the ancient world, they ascribed, and even the Jews ascribed angels, believe it or not, to everything in creation. A little bit like Roman Catholics will talk about saints associated with different things. So there was an angel for the wind, an angel for the rain, an angel for the heat, an angel for the cold, and so on and so forth. The rabbis taught that there were angels ascribed for every single blade of grass that existed. And that some of the angels were actually hostile toward people because they were jealous that God had made us. So what's Paul saying? He knows this is a pervasive belief to the people that are listening. And he's saying, listen, that's just bunk. But if you believe it, guess what? They still don't hold a match to the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. In verse 39, he talks about heights and depths. This is not just, you know, uh, measurable stuff. This is actually referring to the ancient belief of astrological power. We have it today. You open up the Sunday morning paper and you read your horoscope, don't you? You see your sign, your astrological sign, and you kind of feel like this kind of typecasts you and me. In the ancient world, the people Paul was speaking to believed that every person had a planet assigned to them. And the planet determined your destiny. That's what, that was the belief. And so Paul is, by saying this, he's saying, you may believe that, but guess what? The power to which you ascribe these planets pales in comparison to the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. And none of these powers, angels and astrological stuff, none of it can compete. None of it can compete. The bottom line, here's the bottom line for you and me. No terrifying thing in this world or another world has the power to separate you from God's love in Jesus Christ. Nothing whatsoever. You go back to the Old Testament and this is the way Jeremiah puts it. Jeremiah 31. He says, The Lord appeared to us as in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. When you understand what it means for God to be everlasting, the nature of who God is, and to know that how God loves is associated with his nature. It's beyond description, beyond beginning or end. It is unlimited. It's absolutely an amazing gift. God's everlasting love flows from everlasting nature of God. And it's focused on you and me. It's laser focused on you and me. Reaching out to you and me through the Holy Spirit to draw us in and to fill us up. There's a great story that kind of depicts this. It's set in India. Uh, there's an ancient guru who is meditating by the Ganges River. And he, is, uh, he, he opens his eyes after meditating. And he sees floating by him on the river a log that has a scorpion on it. It's sort of within reach. He can hang on to a branch that's coming off the riverbank. And, and so he wants to rescue the scorpion because surely it will drown. He reaches out to the scorpion and predictably it stings him. Ouch! But then he reaches out again to grab the scorpion and it stings him again and he's contorting in pain this time. It really hurt. At that moment, a young man walks by and he says, You stupid old man, don't you know that every time you reach out to that scorpion it's going to sting you? To which he replies, Young man, just because it is the scorpion's nature to sting me does not change my nature to rescue it. You see, no matter how you and I feel about God, treat God, or oriented toward God or away from God, God will always by nature be the one reaching out to you and me. 
seeking to rescue us, seeking to save us, seeking to draw us in. God's eternal, sacrificial, saving, perfect, unconditional love is on display in Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit is reaching out to you and to me so that we might be filled, full to overflowing with His unconditional love, so that we might be filled and given life as you and I could never begin to imagine it. Faith is just recognizing that God is reaching out to you and me and letting ourselves be filled, letting ourselves be rescued. Amen and amen. Let's pray together.